times. And I remember I told you that it is important for you to know about this table here. That was it. Yeah. Yeah, this one. Just to repeat briefly the study designs. And we say study designs. Today, by the way, we will discuss clinical studies and cohort studies. And this, uh, these are a part of study designs. So we continue with the study designs today. That designs where we have uh, experimental studies, experimental, which we call also clinical studies, are also experimental. Huh? They may be animal experiments or human studies. Human studies are called the clinical studies. There might be also animal experiments. Or what kind of other experiment, other laboratory experiments, lab experiments. Okay, then we have the observational studies. By the way, there are more study types, designs, but these are the basic ones. Huh? The observational ones can be cross-sectional. Can you help me to remember them? Anybody? Case control. Case control, very good. Case control. And cohort. And cohort. Yeah, these are the major types of cohort. We can also but repeated cross-section, but it's a version, it's a repetition of the, the cross-section, okay? Repeated cross-section. And I also mentioned about the uh, some other study designs, did I mention? Like what? Epidemiological studies I mentioned last time. Okay. So this table you, you you should have studied. I hope you have it in your mind. And when I ask you whether they are prospective or retrospective, some of them are prospective. Prospective means what? Prospective. or retrospective. Do you know these terms? Hmm? No, you don't study Latin? You see, prospective, retrospective, prospective. Some are prospective, some other study designs are retrospective. So prospective means uh, forward in time, Retrospective means backwards in time, okay? Forward, and this is backward in time. Retrospective means backward. Cross-sectional is one, when we speak of time, okay? When we speak of time, cross-sectional is one section in time, hmm? one point, one time point. So this is, like studying this, the prevalence, the prevalence of a disease. Prevalence you know, don't you? What is a prevalence? We've spoken about the time uh, point prevalence. Do you remember? What was it? Okay, 
I don't remember where it was, but there was the formula for the point prevalence in our book. Here it is. Point prevalence, number with the disease at this time point, divided by the total number of the people. And I have given you the example of wearing eyeglasses in your class. If, if I want to study the, the prevalence of wearing eyeglasses in your class, I have to do, conduct a cross-sectional study. Then is, there is the repeated cross-sectional study, which, which is, of course, you repeat the study in the time, so it is prospective. Hmm? It is prospective. Prospective. A case control study, typically, is a retrospective study, because you have the cases already. Uh, I will de describe this study design data in detail, you have the cases already and you go back into in time and see whether they have uh, some risks or not. So this will be a retrospective design most of the time. And the cohort study we will discuss in detail today is a prospective, an example of prospective studies. Okay. Any questions concerning the study designs? You usually don't have questions. I know. I love this class. They don't ask mm. any questions. Mister? Yes. Can I ask something? I couldn't attend the last lecture, so where can I see the recorded lecture? I couldn't mm. find it in our Google Drive. No, you you, you didn't find it. I don't I know. upload it yet, Big Mai. Uh -huh. Okay, I will upload it and I will notify you. Okay, thank you. Dr. Azamat will upload it. Okay. okay. Today, we want to discuss, I want to discuss with you the clinical trials. So what I mean by clinical trials, I mean the uh, experimental study in, in humans. Okay. And a clinical study is a, a form of planned experimental study. Okay? It's a kind of experimental study, a clinical study uh, to evaluate a new treatment on a clinical outcome. So it's about the medications or a treatment method in humans, in humans. And uh, this uh, when we speak about clinical trials, we have the phases of studies, phases of research. Phases of research. Therefore, the phases of research in our book, they just briefly mentioned phase one, two trials, which is the uh, we investigate the effects of safety and full evaluation of the new treatment. We speak about phase three trials. But it's better if you write down all, all the phases, because that's not uh, all about the phases. And here I open to you the Wikipedia. <laughs> Wikipedia, some believe it's not a good resource to learn, but I believe it's a good resource also for medical students, the Wikipedia. I advise you to, to check something when you need in Wikipedia. So here you see it's a beautiful table, uh, very nice depicted the, uh, the phases of a clinical trial, which can be a preclinical. Okay, this is of course not in uh, on humans. That is also uh, in a, a, any clinical trial has a phase uh, beyond the human. So before having the study in, in people, in human subjects, you have non-human subjects. You do the study at first in the laboratory, on animals or uh, on petri plates. Okay, so then you have the phase zero, phase one, phase two, phase three, and four, phase four. So one question I ask you, uh, I might ask you, is about uh, when the the medication receives. The potential. This is a, the, these are the, the the line, the development line of a medication, of a new method 
of treatment. And at, at, as, at a certain stage, it should have received uh, the, the drug should uh, a patent to be used, patented to be used on humans, to be sold as a medication in the market. The FDA approval, we can call it. Huh? At what stage does it happen? If I ask you at what stage it happens, you should answer, it, it happens at phase two, after phase two. After completing phase two, you have uh, the medication in the market. The, 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 uh, after a successful phase two, the medication comes into the market. Okay, so as you see here, we have in phase, uh, until phase two, we don't speak about the therapeutic doses. We don't speak about the doses of the medication because it is not a medication yet. It is just uh, under development. It is just under development. But after phase two, it is in the market. A phase three medication it means it is aspirin. The medication is paracetamol. You go to the pharmacy and you buy it. It's available in the market. But phase two, at phase two, it is it is striving, it is trying to have uh, approval for to be sold uh, in the market. Okay, that's important. So as you see, it is a tough uh, process. It's not easy. For example, developing the the. Uh, and Im the immunization again against uh, COVID-19. Yeah? Since, since more than, it's, it's already around eight months, maybe, the first cases seen yeah? in was February or March. So we have already seven, eight months passed, but still there is, there is no, medicine there is no vaccination in the market for against COVID-19 why because this process has to be gone through they have to do a preclinical study first then phase two on very few people here it mentioned 10 people but it's just enough if you remember it's very few people and this is about the pharmacokinetics it's also latin term maybe you know it or you don't know it pharmacodynamics and pharmacokinetics Pharmacokinetics means how the medication behaves in the human body. When you take it, how long does it take to, to, to be discharged from the body? Is it, uh, is it leaving the body through the urine, urine uh, through the breath or through the HS? These, these are all need to be studied first. And how long will it stay in the body? What, how it will behave in, in human body? Then you start to study at phase one about the dose ranging and uh, on more subjects. As you see, the number of subjects, voluntary subjects, of course, they increase each time. Later, at phase two, you have around 300. But if you have a medication in the market and you want to study you have to study, of course. Uh, you have to study uh, the therapeutic doses uh, and whether the, the, it is safe, hmm? effectiveness and safety. And then you need much more num larger number of participants, like 3,000 people. And a phase four means after marketing, post marketing surveillance. Uh, that's here at the phase four study, you just compare two uh, medications, let's say, which are approved uh, in the market for treating headache, treating migraine, like paracetamol. We compare paracetamol and uh, aspirin, let's say. That, that the, the, this is, these are already in the market, and we compare two medications. And phase, phase two, you are still behind whether it is effective or safe. And at four, phase four, you don't have any concerns anymore about the, about the safety. So this, this much is enough, I think, about the uh, phases.
you should know that uh, when we speak about clinical trials, there are study phases, okay? And then there is something else. In, it's not only for clinical trials, but for, other, for all study designs, there are standards in standards in reporting, standards in, in writing uh, a paper, a scientific paper. And for the clinical trials, we have the consort statement. So here is a table in the book about the consort statement. Uh, you don't need to memorize all this, but you should know that we have in, in any paper, as, you, in you, as in your uh, practical session projects, you have the title and the abstract, the introduction. Hmm? This already you, you're, uh, you're familiar with, don't you? Aren't you? The title, the introduction, the methods section you have. Then you have the results section. These with capital, you should know huh? the results section, and you have the discussion. So, uh, of course, you, you need to also give uh, uh, references in any study, in any scientific study. But this consort is for, as I said, is for clinical trials. For the other, other study designs, we have other standards. Let me show you a web page for that. Uh, Equator Network. Equator Network. Here it is. Okay. Let's click on that. This is a group working on working on uh, uh, reporting research, writing uh, how to write uh, the standards of uh, writing research, and as you see. Uh, we, in this list, we have all the study designs, all the fem major study designs. For a randomized trial, we call it also the clinical trials. We have the consort uh, checklist. For observational studies, like the cohort study, the case control study, the cross-sectional studies, we have, we have the strobe uh, guidelines. So these two, at least, uh, there is the Prisma, Spirit, and, and many other guidelines, but the consort and stroke, I want you to have in your mind, okay? So, uh, standards, standard in reporting trials, in studies, studies, scientific studies. studies. There are many, but one is the consort and the other is the strobe. Okay. And when I ask you what is consort, you should be able to tell me it is related with which kind of study design. In response, clinical, clinical studies, clinical trials, clinical trials, which is equal to experimental studies, which is equal to what was it mentioned in the book in, in this web page, randomized clinical trials. You can call it also the randomized trials. Randomized. So, there may be different names. And strobe is for observational studies. And you know that observational studies might be case control, uh, uh, cross sectional, cross sectional, case control, etc. But that much is enough about that. Uh, what else I need to tell you about the clinical trials? Uh, in a clinical trial, we have, uh, of course, 
since it is experiment an experimental study, we need to have a control group hmm? in an, ex an experimental study. How it uh, is planned? Experimental studies. In any experiment, you have uh, as population. Hmm? Population, population. In any study, you have the population, of course. Population. From the population, you take a sample, smaller huh? sample, and this sample you divide into at least two arms, maybe more than two arms, but at least two arms. And this we call the randomization, randomization, randomization. In these two arms, one of the arms has to be the study group, the experiment, where you conduct the experiment, and there must be a control group where you don't give the medication. Instead, what you give, you may give another medication, which we call a positive control, or a negative control, or a placebo. Did, did you hear that term, placebo? <clears throat> yes. Okay, so the control group might be, it can be a positive control, positive control, which is another medication, or a negative control which is placebo. But you must have a control group. This is another medication, second medication. Medication two. <laughs> okay. yeah. And then in this study group, you, you conduct, you, you give your medication of interest or you, the method, the intervention of interest. And that has to be, of course, uh, preferably it has to be random. It has to be random, the groups, assigning to the groups. And we have to decide, of course, on the endpoints, primary endpoints, but this already you know, this is the outcome, endpoint, outcome, primary outcome, and we have maybe we may have secondary outcomes as well. We may conduct subgroup analysis and this treatment allocation, randomized or randomization, or treatment allocation, treatment allocation. This has to be, of course, it has to be random. It has to be random. If, if, if you don't make it random, uh, you may introduce bias. There will be allocation bias. Uh, therefore, you have to be very careful with, with, the, uh, with the randomization, allocation to the groups. Uh, please placing the participants into the groups, dividing the participants into the groups. And there is another term called confounder, confounder, because we, in any study, we have an outcome, hmm? an outcome, and we also have the factor, the factor affecting that outcome. So we believe that a factor is affecting the outcome, but there might be another variable, which we call the uh, confounder. Confounder. Please listen carefully. This what is, I'm trying to explain you what is a confounder. A confounder is a factor that affects, that may affect the outcome as well as the factor. It is related with the factor and the outcome. My example here is, uh, let's say, out the outcome is myocardial infarction. Okay? You are studying myocardial infarction and you want to study whether cholesterol, cholesterol is related with myocardial infarction. Do you think cholesterol is related with myocardial infection, infarction? If you have high cholesterol, will it increase the risk of myocardial infarction? Yes. Maybe, yes. Yes, 
Yes, <laughs> high cholesterol means a higher risk of myocardial infarction. So this is obvious, we know that. But there might be confounders which is related both with myocardial infarction and high cholesterol. Tell me a confounder, try to think about a, about a factor which is related with myocardial infarction and which is at the same time related with the cholesterol. I can give you an example. Age, for example. Can age be a confounder? Is age related with myocardial infarction? Yes, of course. Younger people have less risk of myocardial infarction. If your age is increasing, you will have higher risk of getting an MI. Is age related to cholesterol? Yes, it is. If you have, if you are older, you, you will have higher cholesterol. So age is related with both. Hmm? Age is also related with higher cholesterol. Therefore, you have to control for age. When you do this experiment, you study uh, in, the, in your experiment whether high cholesterol and low cholesterol, one group is, has high cholesterol, the other one, one group taking the anti-cholesterol medication, the other group not taking it, and you compare them just concerning the outcome, getting MI or not. And, uh, but you don't think about the age. They are in, in this group, they are older people. In the other group, they are younger people. This will not work. This, this will, this we call, you have confounders in your study. Without controlling the confounders, the groups should be equal concerning the confounders. Another confounder for this example could be sex. Right? Are males or females getting more MI? Heart attack. Who is getting more heart attack? Males. Men, or, men, men, of course. Being a male is a risk factor for getting a myocardial infarction. So do males or females have higher cholesterol? Again, it is males. The men have more higher cholesterol. Therefore, if you if you if your groups are not equal concerning age or sex, and you you make a comparison and you claim that okay. Uh, cholesterol is not related or it is related or this medication is superior to the other one, uh, we, we cannot accept your conclusions. We will, uh, the readers, a careful reader will tell you, okay, you found something, but you have confounders, therefore your study is not reliable. And yes, this uh, randomization can be done in different methods. I will not go through it, uh, but I have to mention about something else here, about blinding or masking. In any, uh, in any experimental study, when, when we randomize that people into the participants into study and control groups, we, sh we should have blinding, blinding. What is blinding? Blind, you know, is you don't see. Nice word they have selected, I think, blinding. So, so this is the study group, the patients who receive, the people who receive the medication, and we have a control group who don't receive the active medication, instead of the active medication, they receive uh, some placebo or the, uh, a lower dose, another dose or some fake medication. So if the people they know, hmm, they know that this group knows that he is receiving an active medication and the other group knows he is receiving a fake medication, it will have some effect in the outcome. Yes. Don't you think it? Mm, yes. No it's just just by believing, just by believing, you have you have that you have received an active medication. You you will have less headache. This is the rule. This is the placebo effect. Even if you don't give any active medication, if you give a fake medication and the patient believes that this is not a, if he thinks 
This is not a fake medication. It is, he's receiving a real medication. He will have some effect, some benefit. This is what they call placebo effect. And the placebo effect can be very strong. It can be up to 30, 50% sometimes. So placebo effect, very important placebo effect. Effect can be up to, up to, 30% sometimes, maybe Dr. Azamat knows better. But to my information, if you give just a, a fake medication and tell the patient that, oh, this is a, a new uh, painkiller, your headache will be gone immediately, and he believes on that, he, at least 30% of his pain will go, will go away. So, Let's come back to blinding. A blinding can be a single blind, single blind, or double blind. Maybe there will be other blind things, but this I leave to you. So single blind or double blind. Uh, a trial, let us read this here, a trial in which the patient the treatment team and the assessors are unaware of the treatment allocation is a double blind trial. So nobody knows which medication is given to which person and also not the patient and also not the doctor or the scientist or researcher. Both of them, they don't know it. This is called a double blind trial. A trial in which it is impossible to blind the patient maybe single blind. When it is impossible to blind the patient, if you are doing an experimental study where you will do an, an operation, an intervention, uh, one group is, will exercise, the other group will, be, will do no, no, no exercise, will stay at home and watch TV. You have two groups in which group, and you, in this case, the patient, of course, will know what he or she is doing. Or there is a medication which has a special taste and you cannot uh, imitate this take, taste. You cannot make a placebo with the same taste. So the patient, by just taking the pill, he will, or uh, swallowing the medication, he will or she will uh, recognize that this is, a, this is the medication. Then you cannot do, of course, blinding of the patient and it will be a single blind. But you should try whenever possible to have a double blind uh, trial by, in which, so single means uh, the doctor doesn't know or researcher and double blinds doctor plus patient. Both are unaware of, uh, of, the, of what's going on here. Why we have we need blinding? Because if you if you as a doctor, you know which medication to uh, to be given to which patient. You are a human being. You have your feelings. When you see a person which you feel mercy for, you feel that he will benefit probably from that medication. You will give the active medication, and the other patient whom do you don't feel empathy you will give the control medication. So you as a scientist, you, uh, you have the probability of introducing uh, a bias. Therefore, it's better if the patient, if the doctor, if the scientist doesn't know about the, the groups, which group is receiving which medication. And of course, the patient shouldn't know because of the placebo effect. There may be also even triple blind because sometimes we introduce errors at the analysis. At the analysis stage is also important. Analysis. During the analysis, uh, you know, we have the SPSS data and you are now, uh, uh, the, the data and, and the softwares and you are familiar now with the SPSS. You know, during the analysis, it's possible to make, arrange the groups and uh, leave out the outliers or do something which, which 
makes you uh, to find that the study group is superior. So th this we don't want either. It's better if you have blinding also during the analysis. So you leave somebody else to do conduct the analysis. If you as a scientist, you don't do. You just prepare the protocol, write the method, and uh, leave the conduction of the study to somebody else, or uh, make sure that it is blinded, even including the analysis. Okay. Time we have? Yeah, it's time for a break. Is there anything else I should mention to you? Let me see. Yeah, of course, with the, mm, yeah, with the pay, in, the, in, a, in, a, in any experimental study, there are ethical issues because you're dealing with medications. It's difficult to have a, ethical approval for any study, for any study, by the way, you need ethical approvals. Uh, there are ethical committees in the hospitals or in the scientific institutions, and you must obtain ethical approval to conduct an experiment, even if it is an animal experiment. You cannot do animal study without approval of, of an ethical board. And uh, the other issue is you need informed patient consent. Each patient must be informed, and you need a written written uh, consent, approval, that the patient is willing to participate in this uh, research. And this, uh, all this is uh, mentioned in the declaration of the Helsinki. So if you want to read more about the ethical issues, you can go and search for the declaration of Helsinki. Or if we ask you in the exam, what is this Helsinki Declaration about? It's related with, you should say that, you should be able to say that it's related with the ethics, the ethics of patient rights. Okay, and lastly, uh, the, during this study, you will have protocol deviations. That also I need to mention, sorry, I wanted to make a break, but uh, without mentioning about the intention to treat, I should not give the break. We have uh, protocol deviations. What is a protocol deviation? Protocol deviation. Deviations. Okay. Uh, as I said, you have the sample. You divided them into two groups. This you did randomly. This is the study group, huh? study group, and this is the control group. Okay. So the study group, let's say, was hundred people, n is hundred, and the control group was also n equal to hundred. You had two hundred people in in your sample. Two hundred. And the, the, the population was, let's say, 1,000 people. 1,000 people. So from a large group of people, you, you have taken a sample, sample, sample 200, you randomly, random, you randomly divided them into, allocated them into study and control groups, and then you measured here something, baseline measurement, baseline measurement. You measured something and you repeated measure. You, you repeat your measurement. The you repeated measurement. You repeat your measurement after some time, after giving the study medication, one week, two weeks, one month, whatever the time. You repeat your measurement. And during this time, of course, there will be some loss of the participants. There will be, if it is, this is an animal study, maybe they will die. If a human study, maybe the patient will not come to the control. He will decide to drop out. There will be dropouts. So let us assume in this group, in the study group, you have, uh, you have 50 people. Huh? I'm exaggerating, of course. Usually you don't have this much dropouts. And in the control group, you have 90 people. OK, 
okay? And you claim that the, you, uh, you, your outcome was uh, blood pressure, okay? My outcome was systolic blood pressure, let's say, okay? In this group, the systolic blood pressure decreased uh, in, in the base, baseline systolic blood pressure was in both groups equal. It has to be equal, of course. 160, let's say, in this group, and 160 in this group, millimeter mercury, okay? So they have, in, in the beginning of the study, the both groups have high blood pressure, and it is almost equal, almost equal. Maybe 161 or something, but it has to be similar. And at the end of your uh, study, you repeat the systolic blood pressure, and here you find it, let's say, 120. And in this group, you find it, the systolic blood pressure, 140. I'm just imputing huh? millimeter mercury again. Okay, so what you see, apparently, the study group is superior. The medication I used here in this group is more effective. It is decreasing the blood pressure. Hmm? If this, the p-value, of course, we have to make a statistical analysis. And let us say the p-value is less than 0 0.05. This was our ruler for the significance. If the p-value is significant, we decide that there is a significant difference between the two groups concerning the blood pressure. But there is one issue, the dropouts. Dropouts. If you have uh, different numbers of diff significantly different dropouts, as it is in this case, 50 here, 90 here, I can claim that, or one, the readers may cl can claim that, okay, you had uh, significantly more blood pressure redu reduction in this group, but the reason for uh, this group, in this group, there might be some, there is an, another issue. There is a problem with your cases. Why you have so many dropouts and in the other group, you don't have so, so many dropouts. Maybe this medication is killing the people. Okay, this is an extreme example, but I, I can claim that. Maybe the 40 people, the, the 50 people here uh, have died or the medication is so difficult to swallow it is so bitter, it is so expensive, it is so difficult to use that the people in this group, the, uh, the experimental group, they decided to drop out, they decided to leave the experiment. So we don't want, in brief, we don't want to have these uh, dropouts. And therefore, they introduced a method in the analysis which they call the intention to treat or on treatment analysis. On treatment means, on treatment is you uh, you analyze your results as it is. But in the intention to treat, intention to treat analysis, if you have intention, there are two methods of uh, here. One is intention to treat, and the other one is on treatment. Okay. In the on treatment analysis you analyze your results as they are. And this is not reliable, okay? So this is not a good method. I'm, I'm satisfied if you just memorize, if you can just memorize. We are trying to do an ITT. Whenever possible, we are trying to do, conduct an intention to treat analysis. We don't want, we don't want to have dropouts. Whew. You can have a break. Ten minutes break. Mm -hmm. okay. okay. Any questions? I can discuss with you during the break if you want. I'm not going anywhere. I have my meat with me. And I drink my milk and we can stay here. Mm -hmm. Let me draw a cohort study first. 
cohort studies is a very important study design, cohort study. In a cohort study, is it prospective or retrospective? Do you remember the previous lecture? Hmm? I don't remember. Ah, oh, that's bad. I'm feeling bad. The, my example for the cohort study is also, again, from the uh, Wikipedia, the British doctor study. There, there are some famous uh, cohort studies, but one is the British. So if I give you the concrete examples, I, I have learned that it's, you, you have more possibility to remember it. The British doctor study, by the way, the cohort is a group of people. You know that, huh? A cohort, a cohort is a group of individuals. So but the word cohort means a group, a group of people. It can be anything. You can imagine any cohort. A co cohort is a, a, the inhabitants of a village. A cohort is the, a stu the students of a school. The cohort uh, is, are the doctors working in UK, okay? In this example, the British doctor study, these are doctors who worked in UK. This study was started in 1951. 1951, what they did, they have taken all the doctors, registered physicians in the United Kingdom, doctors working in the UK. This, this is the number, the total number is 40,000, more than 40,000, 4,700 people. They have invited and they have recruited these people. And then they followed up these people concerning the death, when they are going to die and the, the risk factor they wanted to study is smoking habits, smoking habits. You see this, I, if I show this uh, British doctor study outcomes to my patients, they are very easily con convinced that stopping quitting smoking is very useful. Uh, for, for their health, for their life. You see, in 1951, they recruited the people, 40,000 people, and then they started to follow them. 1957, 1966, 71, 78, and 91, and 2001, in different time points, they measured them. They measure what? They measure whether the person is smoking, two factors, so smoking, or is he alive? Is he alive? So there are non-smokers who never smoked. There are active smokers and there are ex-smokers who quit smoking. As you see from that graph, th these graphs, the out th these are the out uh, findings of the study, the graphs, they are very famous. And I suggest you to read it again, uh, visit this web page and read it again. Uh, you, as you see, uh, the, this, is, this line is, the red line is the cigarette smokers. A person smoking at 40 years of age uh, is dying much earlier. You see, at the end, everybody will die. In 2001, all these people have been dead. Uh, if, if he is 40 years, let's say a medical doctor around the average might be 40 years at 50, 1950. 40 plus 50 years, in 2001, he will be 90 years. So he will be dead. Most of the people live around 90 years. At the end, they will be, all of them will be dead. But you see, those who are smoking, they have a less life expectancy compared to those who uh, quit smoking, ex-smokers, the uh, yellow line, and those who are non-smokers. The non-smokers live longer, of course. If he, if he stops smoking, 
at age 40, at age 40, if he stops smoking, he, he become the yellow line. You see, the yellow line is almost equal to the non-smokers. But if he sm stops smoking after 50, in this figure, the, these are the smokers who stop smoking after 45. After 50 or 45, then there is not that much benefit. You see, there is a visible difference between the yellow line and the blue or black line. There is much more difference. So, therefore, you, if you show the patient this, this figure, you may easily convince that quitting smoking is very important and especially it should be done before 40. After 45, it's not that much useful anymore. You see here, they quit smoking after 55 and that's not effective anymore. The gap always remains. So our issue is of course not about tobacco smoking, but uh, we, are, we want to study, we want to learn about the, the method of cohort studies. In a cohort study, you have the cohort, it can be a, any group of people. My example was the British, British doctor's study, doctor's study, or the Framingham is also Framingham. Can I give you this as a homework to read about Framingham study? Okay, will you do it? Yeah, of course. Thank you. This is your homework. Go and read about the Framingham study. Next week, if I don't forget, I will ask. Framingham study. This is another example of the famous cohort. There are millions, not millions, maybe about thousands of uh, cohort studies, famous cohort studies. Okay, but these are the very famous ones. So you have a cohort of people. Uh, it can be in the Framingham study, it is 5,000. In the British doctor study, it is 40,000. And you have a certain number of people and let's say 40,000. 40,000 people. And to take these people and you follow them, follow them up, it is prospective. Hmm? Prospective. Prospective means what? Forward in time. Forward, yes. Future. Forward in time. Forward in time. Okay. It is a prospective study. So you take these 40,000 people or 5,000 people or 100 people, whatever your cohort is, and you follow them up to the future. Some of them will have the risk factor, risk positive. Some others will be risk negative. So here in the British doctor study, what is the risk? Tobacco smoking. Huh? These are smokers or non-smokers. And you need to have an outcome. What is the outcome in the British doctor study? Whether they live or die. Hmm? There will be, among those who have the risk, there will be uh, alive, that also among those who, do, who don't smoke, there will be some people who have the risk, who are alive, or who are dead, or we can call it the outcome positive. Sorry, this out, alive is outcome negative, of course, and that means outcome positive. Outcome negative, outcome positive. Okay. So this is a classical study design for cohort. And the time is going here. Huh? This is time. This is forward in time. This is, it is prospective, a prospective study design. Okay, let me go to the book. So 
it is important to select the controls, of course. If your outcome is uh, alive or that alive or that that then uh, you cannot include of course dead people can you you cannot include the dead people if your outcome is in the in the framingham study it is myocardial infarction the outcome if the outcome is myocardial infarction and you include people with myocardial infarction, they already have the outcome, isn't it? They already have the outcome. So you should not include people who already have the outcome. Therefore, this cohort has to be healthy people. Healthy concerning what? Concerning the outcome. Of course, they can have migraine, they can have something else. It is not possible to find 100% healthy people. Everybody has some health issues, but it has to be disease-free. So here you see the cohort design. You have a population of people. Among them, there might be some who have already the disease, but you take you 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 don't include these. You uh, exclude these people, and you take the other part of the people. And these disease-free people, you are, some of them are exposed to the factor, some others, they are not exposed to the factor. And you follow them up, follow them up in the, to the future. Some to, of, from those who are exposed, they develop the disease, and some from under unexposed also, they may develop the disease. And the vice versa is also correct. So by this way, if we uh, write it on, an, on a two by two table, we will have something like this, exposed, unexposed, okay? exposed and unexposed, yes and no, and disease of interest, having the disease, having not the disease, A, B, C, D, we can call these cells. Huh? In a cohort study, we have, Classically, this two by two table, two by two table. Okay. So in the columns, we have the risk uh, factor, risk positive, risk negative. And in the rows, we have the disease positive and disease negative. We call this A, B, C and D. Okay. So from that, we can call in a, in a in a uh, cohort study. The if I ask you in the exam, what do we? What kind of statistics do we do? What do we calculate? How do we analyze the cohort study? You should tell me. We calculate the relative risk. Okay. The most important calculation in a cohort study is the relative risk. And how is it calculated? It is called the, the risk of those who are exposed divided by the risk of those who are not exposed. This, who are, what is the risk of those who are exposed here? These are A, A plus C, A plus C. These are those who are exposed to them. And these are those who are not exposed. Huh? risk negative, B plus D, B plus D. So the relative risk would be those who have the disease, A, A upon A plus C, A divided by A plus C, divided by those, the risk in those who are not exposed. The risk in those who are not exposed is, these are the B are, have the disease, and B upon B plus D. B divided by B plus D. It's very simple. This is the relative risk. Okay, so the relative risk indicates the increased or decreased risk of disease associated with exposure to the factor of interest. If your relative risk, for example, is one, what does it mean? 
let us assume it is, if it is one. Any answers? The risk of those who are exposed and the risk for those who are not exposed is equal. Here we have uh, dividing those who, have, who are exposed and not exposed is equal to one. What does it mean? Come on, you know it. There is no risk, eh? no difference. No difference. Isn't it? Yes. There is no difference. Insig non significant, non significant, or p value above or equal to 0 0.05. Okay? Because what, a risk of one means the risk is equal. My risk and your risk is equal. It is one. Multiply by one. We have the equal risk. The risk of those who are exposed and non-exposed, if they divide it and it is one, it means there is no, no difference. If the risk is below one, if the relative risk is below one, what does this mean? That this risk factor, this factor is protective. Hmm? It is increasing, you see. Below one means those, let's say this is smoking, smoking positive, smoking negative. And this is myocardial infarction, okay? My example here is myocardial infarction, myocardial infarction negative. This group has myocardial infarction, this group does not have the myocardial infarction, heart attack. So if the, if I would have in this, exp, in this design, in this cohort study, if I would have a relative risk of less than one, it would mean what? Smoking is protecting from MI, from getting heart attack. Beneficial. It's beneficial, thank you, yeah. So this is, this means, this implies it is beneficial. It has a benefit, it is useful, okay? If, it, if my relative risk is above one, it means there is a risk. The p-value is less than 0 0.05. There is a significant risk. The risk is higher among those who have the, who have the, uh, the risk of getting the disease is higher among those who are exposed to the risk factor. Ooh, yes, so th this you have to read, but you can, if you understood the concept, you could figure out what are the advantages and disadvantages of a cohort study. The advantage, the main advantage is, it is uh, you can calculate the incidence of the disease because you are following up the people with the time, you know exactly how many people have uh, developed new disease? You can calculate it. And you can calculate the relative risk uh, using the cohort study. And you don't have the problem of recall bias because you don't, you, you don't ask the pe pe person to memorize how much cigarette he smoked. You just measure it day by day or year by year by yourself. You observe and you measure it. But the disadvantage, one disadvantage is it is ex costly. It is costly, of course. It requires time. It requires time and money. Mm -hmm. it is long periods of time, long periods of time, and it is costly. And there are other disadvantages as well. Uh, of course, since you will follow up these people for a long time, there will be dropouts. The pa some of the patients will migrate, they will leave the study, and this will cause you troubles. Okay? Yeah. Just read them. If you don't understand, ask me, we'll discuss it. Um, 
Okay, monitoring for participants that I will not mention. I think you can easily understand by reading. And lastly, I mentioned about the clinical cohorts. We may have the cohort usually is a group of people, as I said, but uh, it's, it is since it requires time and uh, resources, economic resources. Uh, it's not frequently done. The cohort studies are, are is a rare study design in daily practice. But um, since most of you will become doctors, clinicians, you could do some cohort studies on your patients, on your clinical cohort. You can decide, decide a, that a group of your people will be your cohort and you follow them up uh, for for, a, for an outcome uh, and risk factors in, uh, in your office. What can be a clinical cohort? Like it can be people with hypertension in your office or people, if you are a neurologist, specialist of neurology, you can have your pe pe people with, uh, uh, with Alzheimer or pe your patients with, uh, Having, where having a seizures, a type of seizures, uh, epileptic seizures. You can follow these people for some certain risk factors and some outcomes. And this will become in this case a clinical cohort. So uh, although cohort studies are difficult compared to the other studies, it is difficult to conduct the cohort studies. Uh, you can easily do, I believe. Uh, clinical cohorts. I don't know whether you will remember my advice once you, when you become a doctors, uh, but if you remember, please uh, be aware that you can conduct clinical cohorts. Okay, so in summary, here we have also a nice example, uh, smokers and myocardial infarction. Uh, in 10 years, you see the estimated relative risk here is, was calculated as two. And uh, there is also the confidence interval. You remember in our previous lectures, we mentioned about the confidence interval. And uh, the confidence interval, by the way, by the way, I must say this before I close this session, the confidence interval of, of relative risk of relative risk should not include one. Of course, you know this, but I just repeat it. Huh? Should not include one. Why? Why one? Because if the relative risk, uh, the confidence interval includes one, it means it is no, there is no difference. There is no difference. You remember in my previous lectures, I mentioned to you about the, the relative, the confidence interval of the difference. The confidence interval of the difference should be, should not include zero. Do you remember? If the confidence interval is, includes zero, zero difference means no difference. And in, in the, the case of risk, the, the the risk of one means no risk, no difference. Therefore, it should not include one. So you see, in this example, in the MI, we have a relative risk of two. Those exposed, the risk in, among the, those who are exposed, and the, the risk among those who are not exposed, it is here, the, the, they switch the rows and columns here, okay? So, if you calculate it, it is two. A risk of two of those who smoke have a risk of two compared to the, those who not smoke in getting myocardial infarction. And here is the confidence interval. It says, if you do this experiment 100 times, in 95 of the cases, you will have a relative risk of uh, as low as 1.6 or as high as 2.4, but it is always above one. 
does not include one. So if I ask you, if I show you this figure, the relative risk of uh, the confidence interval of the relative risk, and I ask you, what could be the p-value here? Your answer should be, the p-value here is certainly less than 0 0.01. Hmm? If it is above one and the confidence interval not including one, it means it is significant. Yeah, I hope I could describe you something. I should help you to understand the cohort studies in this session. That's all, folks. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Take care. We will meet next week, hopefully, in good health. Study good, stay safe and healthy. Bye bye. Bye. Thank you, Dr. Kiriam.